If you want to open in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. I want to echo what Aaron mentioned about the youth reunion uh, and what a, a, a joyful time we had Friday night and Saturday gathering with these four churches, including ours, and the youth and parents that came uh, from all across Texas, really, to meet with the Lord, to meet with each other. And uh, I mentioned on that evening that we believe as a church by conviction and by, by the basis we have in God's Word that there will be a, a gospel witness in every generation. Uh, the gospel witness will, will not die out uh, after a certain generation because God is faithful to his words, faithful to his gospel. But I, I mentioned to the youth there, it is certainly our, our personal hope and desire and I think godly jealousy that the youth of our church, of our churches, will be a, a portion of that witness. That's certainly our desire. It's somewhere out there, there certainly is going to be a next generation that rises up to represent the gospel, that holds the gospel doctrine, that loves the authority of God's word, that lives for the glory of God. But we, we are hoping, we have a, a hope, a godly ambition that the youth of our church, our churches, will form a, a portion of that. So I want to personally thank the parents especially who labored uh, to pull off this youth reunion. Thank you for investing in the next generation of our church. And I also want to thank the youth who came uh, to this gathering to hear from God's word. Thank you for prioritizing the gospel and fellowship and godliness. We love you as I mentioned yesterday. We are grateful for you and it is our honor to be partnering with you in this mission that we have. Uh, well, let's open to this magnificent book one final time in this series. And let's remember that God's word is open before us. Every word possesses authority over us, carries us forward into God's purpose for our lives, and let us read his word with reverence and faith and humility and joy this morning. This is Luke's final story of the early church, full of meaning for our church and God's people in each generation. Let's begin reading in verse 17 of Acts 28. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, Though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against." When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense 
and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Sometimes when I'm preparing for a message in a given week, I'll make my way to a coffee shop on 79, uh, Palm Valley Boulevard right there, right across from the railroad tracks. And I don't know if there's a different rating of railroad tracks, but it seems to me that the trains that go along that railroad track are abnormally large and unusually loud. Uh, sometimes I'll be outside, I'll get a phone call or something, and I'll step out and be talking, and that'll be the moment that a train goes by, and I have to apologize profusely uh, that I am not in a war zone. I am just actually outside uh, talking, and there's a train. The, the, the ground shakes by the trains that rumble by. Sometimes I've, I've found myself uh, just wondering, imagining, as I see these, these closed uh, cars and, and freight cars, so to speak, just coming by, imagining them filled with the very heaviest of freight. And you can imagine just, just one of those cars uh, would weigh uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of pounds, would, would crush virtually anything that stood in its way. And then before me, I'll, I'll see this lengthy train, car after car after car, in, in my imagination, imagination, just filled with, with this heavy freight rumbling down the track. The whistle shrieks, and there's this, this sense of invincibility and, and power and, and strength and unstoppable just massiveness, and it, it shakes the ground under your very feet. It, it, it splits the air. And that train reminds me of the book of Acts. It, it reminds me of the gospel message as it is portrayed in this book that we have studied together. It is, it is like this living train that, that rumbles with unstoppable force, that even seemingly daunting obstacles and difficulties just give way before it. That the gospel message, the, the good news about Jesus in Acts is, is this, this force that, that shakes the very ground. It shakes the very, the very foundations of culture. It shakes people's hardness of heart and their, their dispositions and their religious background and their assumptions and their prejudices. It shakes them out and it, it drives forward in a way that, that transforms the landscape. That is the gospel in the book of Acts. And the, the last story in this book finds Luke saying essentially yet again to the church that the gospel is God's unstoppable force. And the implication for the church is we must have faith to give ourselves to the gospel as it rumbles forward in God's purpose. There is nothing, according to Luke, that can stop the advancing gospel. And therefore, our hearts must throw ourselves towards its momentum, must give ourselves to its message, because it's the one unstoppable force in human history, the message of Jesus, the crucified and risen Savior. There is nothing, Luke says, that stops the gospel. And this last story makes that point with a final exclamation point at the end of his book. Let's look down here at this passage and see how Luke makes this point. He, he's, he's describing Paul as he arrives in Rome, in Rome. He is a prisoner of the Romans. So he is, in one sense, in captivity. And yet, in the other sense, he is precisely where God wants him to be. And that is the, the paradox that we th see through Acts. From a human perspective, from a human uh, a, a standpoint, these gospel witnesses often seem weak and incapable. From a human standpoint, there is nothing train-like about Paul. Paul is not the train. Paul seems like a, a flimsy, worthless man actually there on the tracks of Jewish injustice and, and Roman power and just vulnerable to the whims of a mob. 
But behind the physical scenes, we see a train rumbling forward that is, is not stopped by any uh, indication of, of, of difficulty or any opposition from the Jewish people or from the Romans. Paul is in Rome testifying to the gospel of God, which is where God wanted him all along. So in spite of the opposition, in spite of the trial, in spite of the shipwreck, in spite of a snake bite on Malta, Paul is in Rome after all. And I think that's exactly the point. Here he is in Rome, despite all appearances. And once again, he's speaking to Jews. He's appealing to them. He's testifying to them. And then when they leave, he's testifying for two whole years about the grace of God. What's happening? The gospel message continues to go forward, even though Paul's in prison, even though he's under house arrest, even though people still reject it, even though he's still facing opposition. No, no, the gospel message will not be stopped. I think that's Luke's final exclamation point. And we can, we can see some of the themes of Acts present in this final story. How does the advancing gospel advance? How does it advance? And when we, we chose the tagline of this series intentionally because the gospel is advancing. It's not ultimately we who determine whether it will advance or not. It is advancing. It's just whether we want to be a part of that or not. It's the advancing gospel. The gospel that by its very nature as the message of the infinitely powerful God advances around the world. Th three aspects of the way that it advances that I think we see in this passage. First of all, it advances in the face of opposition. It advances in the face of opposition. The opening paragraph here, if you look down at your Bibles, is Paul basically reviewing what we know as readers of Acts regarding his trial. He points out to these Jewish leaders that he is innocent of the charge. He has not militated against his people in some civic unrest. He has done nothing, he says, against his people or the customs of our fathers. He was not trying to get them to, to stop being Jewish culturally. Yet, in spite of his innocence, he says, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of Rome. And it's not just he who thinks he's innocent, the Romans also, in verse 18, wish to set him as at liberty because there's no reason for him to be held. So Paul's innocence is set in contrast with his imprisoned status. But the Jews, again, are unwilling to see Paul set free. So what do they do? They object to the Romans setting him free. We know that story. We've read it. And so Paul is basically forced to save his life by appealing to Caesar so he'll be taken to Rome. He uses a, a legal advantage to get out of the Jewish kind of area of control so that he can appeal to Caesar. So the, the point here is, let's remember, Paul says, and Luke says to his readers, and Paul introduces to these Jewish leaders in Rome, I, I, I have been falsely accused, and yet I am in prison. So he's essentially asking them and inviting them to see beyond what their physical eyes can see. It may seem as though I'm a criminal because you see me wearing this chain, but I am actually innocent. He's inviting their faith to see beyond what their physical eyes can see. It may seem as though I'm dangerous, but even the Romans think I'm innocent. I have nothing against my nation, he says. I, I have no desire to bring a countersuit against them, but I, I do want to speak to you because it's actually, he says, because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. So the gospel advances through opposition, and this opposition in this passage is ironic, like much of Acts is ironic. Why? Because Paul is saying, ironically, the very hope of Israel is the cause of Israel's rejection. The, the reason I'm in chains is because of the opposition of the Jewish people, but the reason they're opposing me is because I was delivering to them the very hope that God wanted to give them about the Messiah. So they've rejected the very thing that could save them. So again, he, he invites these Jewish leaders to see something. He says, look, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in chains because I believe that God has given hope to Israel. Now, now we know this story, but Luke brings it up again to, I think, accent in his final moments with his readers. The, the endless reality that faithfulness to the gospel message will result in innocent suffering. 
in innocent opposition. Innocent, by that I mean uh, Paul's not sinless, but he has done nothing to deserve the opposition that is coming his way. It is the gospel message itself that generates opposition. It is the hope of Israel itself that even Israel itself opposed. He said, those who most should have listened and heard and received, they rejected me and even, and even sought to keep me in chains. The very hope of Israel brought Israel's antagonism, and I am in chains because of that opposition. And we've, we've referenced this point throughout the book of Acts. I, I want to make a, a pastoral application. But brothers and sisters, <laughs> Acts teaches us many things. But one thing it definitely teaches us is that if we want to be faithful to the gospel, we must be prepared for opposition to that message. We must assume that faithfulness will include some kind of cultural opposition. Now, we are not preaching to first century Jews, but the basic reality of the human heart says when God declares there is one Savior and Lord that all men and women must bow before, the human heart will react with denial and rejection of that message. And so how does the gospel advance? How does God's gospel go forward? Where would we take a lesson from Acts about this? How, how will the gospel go forward in our day? It will go forward in the face of opposition. Paul reviews his trial and he reminds, Luke reminds his readers, remember, I am on trial because I believe in the hope of Jesus Christ. That is the reason for my suffering. That is the cause of my suffering. If I didn't hold to the gospel, I wouldn't be a prisoner. The gospel advances through opposition. Very, very important that the church receive the preparation that Luke intends to give to us so that we are not uh, fearful or, or concerned or, or avoiding opposition when that moment comes for our church. One of the reasons we walk through this book as a church is so that we would be spiritually prepared that standing for Jesus will require facing opposition. But that opposition is not able to actually bind the gospel message. I think there's, a, there's an intentional contrast here throughout this passage painted between the advance of the gospel and Paul's confinement. So Paul's in chains, but he's preaching the gospel in Rome. And if we go all the way back to the beginning of the book, remember, the ends of the earth was where Jesus said the gospel message would get to. So somehow, ironically, Paul, the messenger of the gospel, is a prisoner but is still advancing the gospel. So the train goes forward even though Paul is in chains. That is true in our day as well. When churches face opposition, when they face the difficulty of, of, of pressure culturally and, and, and the pain of abandonment and rejection and disownership by family members, th that does not mean the gospel isn't going forward. It has always advanced in the face of opposition. Churches are not healthy only in those moments when they are not opposed. Oftentimes, they are the most healthy when they're being opposed. So what does this mean for us? It means that at some point in our future as individuals or as a church, we might face a moment of opposition. I, I, I want to do, if I can, I want to I mail this passage and this book ahead, ahead to us in that moment. So in that moment of trial, we open that letter, and this letter that we've mailed to ourselves, and it triggers a response in our mind. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Opposition is, is, is not a sign of our failure in the gospel. It, it may very well be a sign of God's calling to us to be faithful to the gospel in this moment. So, so when that day comes and there's opposition in your family or from your children or from this culture in this community, let's, let's keep this letter for ourselves and open it in that moment. No, how does the gospel advance? Always in the face of opposition. Let's not be surprised. Let's not be troubled. Let's not be uh, shaking at the knees at that moment. What, what shall we do? As I've said before, Acts removes the worst case scenario from the fears of the Christian and makes it clear when that worst case scenario happens, you continue to represent Christ. It advances in the face of opposition. It also advances through biblical proclamation. 
Also a theme in Acts that Luke accents again here at the end of this passage. After he makes this initial defense, we, we find surprisingly, and I think a sign of God's providential care, that, that the, the Jews from Judea have somehow not been able to get communication to them about how dangerous this man Paul is. I think we're supposed to see something of God's sovereign protection of Paul in that, because we remember how, how vehement they were in Judea. But whether it's because of the storm, Paul got there faster than their letters could, uh, or, or somehow they they're just don't have the influence to reach even into the Jewish uh, synagogue in Rome, we, we don't know why, but for whatever reason, God has preserved Paul's reputation so that he can have a hearing from these people in Rome. And so, it, it, again, we see the sovereignty of God, preserving and protecting Paul, even as he allows Paul to suffer. But Paul uses that moment to do what he always does, to testify to who Jesus Christ is. Notice in verse 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. And notice from morning till evening, a day full seminar of Christ-centered teaching from the Apostle Paul, he testifies to the kingdom of God, trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So we notice this, this biblical proclamation is the means of the gospel advancing. That's through, throughout Acts, that's the case. The core of this freight train of gospel advancement is is verbal proclamation, and verbal proclamation from the scriptures. We've seen this throughout Acts. Peter at the beginning, he's quoting Joel, and he's applying the truth of Joel, the prophet, to the experience of the church in Pentecost. We see, we see Paul referencing Old Testament scriptures. There, there is this doggedness about bringing the Bible and the truth about Jesus into the ears of those willing to listen. There's a doggedness about that. They will not get away from talking about Jesus according to the scriptures. Again and again and again and again. What, what that means is the freight train of the gospel is present when the mouth of the church is opened in the scriptures and to the centered point on Jesus Christ. Paul speaks to them from the law of Moses and from the prophets, it should motivate us. <laughs> Certainly, if Paul can preach the gospel from Leviticus, we should be able to bring the gospel from Romans. Certainly, if Paul can bring the gospel from Isaiah, we should be able to bring the gospel from the gospel of John. We certainly have an easier task than Paul did in bringing the gospel from the scriptures. And we should also be able to talk about why Jesus is the Messiah from the Old Testament as well. We should be able to reference passages like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 103, just to name a few easier ones, and, and point out how they speak to a Messiah who is God and man, who suffered for sinners, who died on the cross, who rose again. We should be able to point to those scriptures and say, on the basis of God's word, Jesus fulfilled God's promise that there would be a Messiah, a Savior, to ransom people for God from every tribe and nation and to forgive their sins and to bring them into reconciliation with him. Brothers and sisters, here's the application for our church that I think we need to feel from the book of Acts. We are not all called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, but we are all called to be representatives of this gospel. Notice even the apostle to the Gentiles is able to exercise his ministry sitting in a house in Rome with a chain on his wrist. Now, if there's ever a place that we can certainly identify with Paul, it's in this moment when he is not traveling, he's homebound. And yet he is using his home as a base to communicate the truth about Jesus. Now, I believe in what's been called friendship evangelism, servant-hearted evangelism, where, where people and Christians seek to do uh, practical things to bless those who are their neighbors. I, I think that is a valuable way of loving our community and, and serving others, and it adorns our gospel message. 
finding ways to, to bless others and, and build up others and, and just their physical needs, I think that is a valuable and important calling for the church. But if we look at Acts, the heartbeat of the train going forward is not physical provision, but biblical proclamation. So we want to distinguish between the priority and secondary values that adorn that priority. So our primary responsibility as the church, our primary responsibility is to represent the word of God and its center point on the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is our, our primary responsibility. Now we certainly should look for ways to gain access through servant-hearted outreach and, and blessing others physically and trying to improve our world in practical ways. But, but those things by themselves do not advance the gospel. If they are by themselves, they don't rescue anyone. And in Acts, we see the emphasis is on, is on the proclamation of God's truth. And we need to unashamedly say that. This is not a, a truth-loving culture. It, it loves physical servanthood, but, but it doesn't love proclamation. It, it dislikes that. It's uncomfortable with that. I mean, you, you love hearing about people laying down their life practically. I mean, that, that's going to get a lot of likes on Facebook, whereas the, the moment where someone just begins talking to others about Jesus, uh, that's not particularly popular in this culture. And yet if we look at Acts, what advances the gospel? Messages. Speaking. What does Paul do when he goes to Corinth and Rome and Galatia and, and, and Thessalonica? What, what, does he, what does he do? What, what is the activity that advances the gospel? Speaking. And speaking biblical truth. Not just personal testimony. Not just kind of the opinion that we have that the gospel is, is better. I think you should try it out. No, it's, it's biblical truth. It's, it's daring to represent God because he has called us to that task. It's claiming to, to say that God has spoken and human beings must believe. The gospel advances through biblical Proclamation. You want to notice from morning till evening, Paul seems to have no end of testifying to the kingdom of God, of representing and trying to convince them. He's trying to persuade them. I, I've been struck by this uh, even in my very, very timid attempts at, at reaching out to those that, I, as far as I know, are not believers. I was, I was talking to someone at a, a hair place the other day. I was getting my hair cut. And, and this was like, I, I think God gives me these barn doors because he knows I don't do very good at small doors, even these barn door openings. So she asked me what I do for a living. I said, well, I'm a pastor. And she immediately said, well, preach to me. I need to hear it. <laughs> now that is a sign of God's assessment of my maturity, okay? <laughs> so I did. I mean, I thought, well, if you can't get that one right... So I, I began to speak to her as best I could about the gospel, but in thinking about that conversation, what, what, what struck me was, you know, oftentimes um, I am most uncomfortable with the trying to convince part. If I even do get through the door, well, we believe in our church that Jesus died for sinners, and I kind of present the facts. But getting to the trying to convince part is very uncomfortable. I mean, at, at any level, even trying to convince someone that it would be valuable for them to come on a Sunday and hear a biblical message about Jesus. Boy, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? That makes it sound like we actually think that we know what God has said. <laughs> the question is, do we think we do? Paul was trying to convince them. To increase his popularity? <laughs> no. If Paul knows anything, he knows the harder I try, the worse it gets. Why is he doing it? One of these men. One of these ladies. They might see. They might suddenly see. He's hoping. He's trying. 
trying to convince them. I would suspect if you're like me, <laughs> you need wide open doors. I, I, I pray God helps me to make the door smaller. I literally hear somebody say, preach to me. I, I hope I learn to walk through smaller doors. But I, I also hope I can grow in the trying to convince. Gently, graciously, not arrogantly, but, but trying to convince. Do, do, do you see this? Let me, let me urge you to believe. Let me urge you to come and listen. Let, let, me, let me invite you and uh, please, please come. P please listen. The, the gospel goes forward through biblical proclamation. Just a quick application point. Brothers and sisters, we need to uh, make the Bible a living tool in our outreach to others. Uh, let me just ask you, how many sections of scripture could you either quote by memory or go to and open and, and relate to a, a person about the gospel? The, the more of those passages that you have, the more type of person you can more easily relate to. If, if you only have John 3.16, it is valuable and you should use that. But there's a lot of Bible that could relate to a lot of different kinds of people. So one reason we need to know our Bibles is so that we don't have just this, this one single verse that we relate to every kind of different person, the, the struggling and the suffering and the defiant and the, the, the disillusioned and the, the old and the young and the, 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 the arrogant and the resigned. We, 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 there's a lot of scriptures that all talk about Jesus that could be used more, more uniquely in that moment if we know them and if we know at least where they are, where we can open to them, where we can maybe send them and text them or email them or speak them. Paul is able to speak from the law and the prophets about Jesus. And if he can do that from the law and the prophets, certainly, certainly we can do that from the gospels of Jesus Christ and the epistles that talk ceaselessly about him. The gospel advances through biblical proclamation. As we've seen again and again, this proclamation does not result in universal response. It happens here. Some are convinced, it says in verse 24, but some disbelieve. That is normal in gospel proclamation. Listen, as pastors, we don't think faithfulness in our church results in a 100% conversion rate. We think faithfulness is a church that is consistently and ongoingly speaking God's word to others. If we're not doing that, we are concerned. If we are doing that, and yet we're not seeing an overwhelming number of conversions, we're, we're trusting that to the Lord. Some are convinced, but others disbelieve. Some sense life, others sense death, Paul says elsewhere. And Paul says that actually this response to gospel proclamation was God's foreknown plan because he says from Isaiah the prophet that this people, especially the, the, the native Israelites, they, they are always seeing, but they don't perceive. They, they, they see with their eyes and they hear with their ears the gospel message, but they don't see anything worth doing anything about. They can hear the name of Jesus, but they don't love him and trust him. It would be like standing while a, a massive rumbling train is, is riding by and acting like nothing is happening. I see nothing. It's a quiet, peaceful day. And Paul is saying, can't you feel the ground shaking with the gospel message? And they say, I don't know what you're talking about. So this proclamation for Paul resulted in his very own brothers and sisters ethnically seeing but not seeing, hearing but not hearing. Their heart was dull, and the Lord predicted this would be their response. And yet even their rejection results in Paul turning to the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. So even the rejection of the proclamation served in God's purpose as a, a springboard for Paul going to the nations. Look, even, even the rejection of the gospel message by the Israelite nation for Paul only accelerated God's purpose to reach the nations. 
Listen, this, this train will not be stopped. It wasn't stopped by the rejection of the Jewish people, at least in the first century. Actually, that only accelerated Paul's proclamation to the nations about Jesus. So if Paul is not discouraged ultimately from preaching by the rejection of God's very ethnic people in that first century, we certainly should not be discouraged when we experience rejection from some Gentile neighbor next door who never heard about Jesus and never read the Bible. We, we should certainly not be discouraged at the prospect of rejection. We should keep proclaiming the gospel and look for those that will listen. It advances through biblical proclamation that is persuasive, that is sometimes convincing to someone and at other times rejected by others. And both responses we should find expected and should only motivate us to bring the gospel further. Finally, it advances by a global welcome. The final paragraph here after this meeting with the Jews, when they disperse, some are convinced, some are disbelieving. Final paragraph, leaves Acts and leaves Paul in the biblical record doing what he has always done. Very, very important to see how Luke ends Acts. Verse 30, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. What's he doing? Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It advances by a global welcome. I've referenced before that Paul's preaching, his teaching, his communication is the center of his calling. But what I want to emphasize here is that he's doing this, though bound and imprisoned, incarcerated in this home, and he's unable to move about. And yet, the gospel is advancing as he welcomes all who come to him. I love that phrase. He welcomed all who came to them. And when they came, they got to hear about the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he spoke to them with all boldness and without hindrance. Notice the irony of Luke's presentation of the gospel. It's consistent throughout the book. Look, hindrances are not hindrances. Uh, suffering will serve only to advance the gospel. The prisoner Paul is proclaiming the advancing gospel. Paul can find, is Paul courageous? I mean, there's this irony throughout the book. It, it, no situation will finally limit the advance of the gospel. It fall, if, if Paul is bound to a house, he decides that that house has now become a teaching center and that people are going to have to come there and he's going to talk to them about Jesus. I, I, I love this and in, in what it communicates to the church of every generation, look, the gospel is not bound. Even if you are confined to a location, the gospel is not bound. And it must not be bound in your heart and in my heart. We also must desire to welcome all who come across our path and to look for ways to represent the Lord Jesus Christ to them. Look, if, if there's ever a passage that should encourage mothers in Acts who are at home with young children, th this is a great passage. Paul's in a house, but what does he do with anyone who comes to him? He teaches them about the kingdom of God with a boldness and without hindrance. If there's anyone who is, who is kind of stuck in an area where they, they don't particularly like the city they're in, but they're there because they have a job or they have certain responsibilities that keeps them there, and they, they feel confined or limited. I, I wish I could, I could get out and, and do something important. Listen, Paul's been in prison now for four years. The Apostle Paul, two years in Caesarea. He's in Rome for two years, presumably still a prisoner. And, and that was God's intention for the way Paul could advance the gospel. Sometimes we're called to go out, and sometimes we're called to welcome in. I think it's very important to ask ourselves the question, is my heart wide open to those God would bring to me to represent the Lord Jesus to them? We must be the church of the wide open heart. Not the closed heart, not the fearful heart, not the suspicious heart, not the questioning heart, not the uncertain heart. The, the, the church of the wide open heart. 
Paul welcomes all who comes to him. He, he, he's, he's not concerned about whether they come cynical, whether they come uh, disingenuous, whether they come disinterested. He, he, he comes, he, he's, he's concerned with, with whether they can get the message. We need this kind of global welcome in our church and in our heart. We need this, this desire that, that any would come to us. We could even apply this about this room in this church. Look, brothers and sisters, it, it should be our heart's desire that people would come and hear. We can't save them, but we can certainly welcome them and encourage them and invite them. Come and hear. Come and hear. Come and hear what God has said about salvation and the way that, that people who have wandered from him can be brought back. Come and hear about Jesus Christ, who was righteous, but he suffered in the place of sinners. Come and hear about God who comforts the weary and the weak and who promises eternal life to anyone who will believe in him of, of any age, of any social background, of any ethnicity, of, of any social status. Uh, anyone, anyone, Paul says, can come and, and hear about the kingdom of God because this kingdom, it's not a matter of, of, of social status or, or racial background or, or, even, or even personal failure. It, it's a matter of transformation by the grace of God and the mercy of God coming to sinners. It's, it's a wonderful kingdom. It's a kingdom you can't see with your eyes, but God can reveal it to your soul. And if you come and you listen to these, these songs about Jesus, you'll, you'll begin to perceive that kingdom, I think. You'll see something that you can't see. You'll hear something that you can't hear, and you'll understand something you can't understand because God, God wants to open your eyes and your ears and your heart to see what is the most glorious, powerful force in this universe. Now, all of that passion could be contained in, I would love to see you come to church. I would love to have you over. I'd love to get to know what's going on in your life. I'd love to invite you. We have a get-together. It's a bunch of Christian friends. We just eat a meal. Would you like to come and get to know us? I'm not saying every moment is a pulpit moment, but I'm saying every moment should be a welcoming moment. If there was a, a mat outside the door of our heart, what would it say? Unwelcome. No difficult people. Don't come if you need a lot of help. Paul welcomes all who come to him. We find out at one point in Paul's life that one of the people that, that comes across his path is this, this runaway slave who apparently in running away also stole something from his owner. And, 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 and Paul apparently reaches out to this individual who in that culture would have had no, no, no cultural standing or status. But, but Paul views him as just a, another human being who is in need of Jesus, and he, he preaches the gospel to him. And, and what happens? He's converted. He's motivated to restore what he stole. We read in Philemon about the possibility of a, a great reconciliation where this former slave is welcomed as a brother. Brothers and sisters, no person that comes across our path is beyond the reach of God using us to represent him in helping them by bringing the message of Jesus. What we are praying that this book does, we, we are praying this, and I would invite you to pray and apply this with us. We, we are praying it does these three things. We are praying that it leaves its mark in our hearts and in our church in these three ways. We are praying that it, it causes us to have faith in the face of cultural opposition. Because that's how the gospel advances. 
It always has. It always will. That we would be a, a sturdy church, not flimsy, not tentative, not timid, not worried, not anxious, sturdy in the face of opposition. We're praying that it makes us a church of biblical proclamation, that we would represent God's word where we have opportunity. And we're praying it makes us a church with a heart to welcome and reach people who need to hear about Jesus. We're praying that it does those things. We, we've been studying this book now for a year, a year of our life, studying the book of Acts, God's word in this book. And we are, we are praying that it accomplishes these things in our heart. Let me invite you as a pastor, on behalf of the pastoral team, let me, let me invite all of us to ask ourselves, Lord, is my life changing as a result of your word? In those three areas, am I less fearful of opposition? Am I more passionate about knowing and proclaiming your word in its center point, the gospel of Jesus Christ? And is my heart open to welcoming and reaching all who need to hear this message? Listen, after reading 28 chapters of those themes woven in different stories and different situations, look, we, we better be more that way than we were when we started this book a year ago. We need to respond to God's word. If we don't respond to it in surrender, we are responding to it in disbelief. And, and we don't want to do that. We, we must become less fearful of opposition, more eager to biblically pass on the truth that we know about Jesus, and more open-hearted to reach out to those who need to hear this message. That is what responding to the book of Acts look like. And all of that is fueled by the absolute central message that nothing can stop this gospel. We don't have to apply that message in our own strength or in our own power or without certainty about the end. Our, our response is, as it were, attached to this freight train of gospel progress. Listen, if, if you took a little heart shaped paper that represented you and you stuck it on the side of that train when it left the station by the time it's roaring by me at that coffee shop look that that heart has a momentum that cannot be stopped not because it is powerful but because it's attached to the one unstoppable force in the universe it's not because Paul is strong. It's because he's sitting on he's straddling this gospel message that will not be stopped it's not as though the engineer on that train has some kind of individual power to knock down obstacles and to overcome strongholds and to penetrate the spiritual powers of darkness in this world. He doesn't have any physical or mental power to do that. But he is straddling, he is sitting squarely on a train that cannot be stopped, that shakes the very ground, that penetrates the culture, that alters the landscape, that breaks hard hearts, and that opens up the world for the gospel. That's what Paul's sitting on, and that same gospel is given to us. So as we apply these three primary themes, we are not doing it because of our value or our worth or our strength or our maturity. We're doing it solidly sitting on a train that knows no obstacle greater than its power. There is no stopping the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's get on board and let's see it continue to advance in our day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that our church would be full of faith. Full of faith, Lord. I pray you would give us faith to love those who need to hear your truth, to welcome them into our heart, into our life, into this meeting. Lord, I pray you give us a boldness in the face of any and all opposition. I pray you give us a, a biblical saturation, that we would know your word and how it focuses on the message of your salvation. Lord, change us by your word. Transform us. Make us different. Make us more like Acts than we were a year ago. Cause us to apply it, we pray. We love you and we thank you 
and we are grateful for you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.